I'm, I'm very grateful to have the chance to talk to, to you this evening. And I'm also, uh, I, I've been rather intrigued by the, the challenge of talking about the future of, of television um, in front of a group of people who, on, at least on the face of it, are principally interested in the internet. Um, what I want to say, though, is this is, I think, I found it an extraordinarily appropriate thing to think about because certainly in the world of conventional broadcasting, the question of what and how conventional media and conventional media consumption, what happens to that in the internet age has been in many ways the central, the central preoccupation of the BBC and other big broadcasters around the world. And if I had one point to get across, uh, I've been in this job, uh, uh, as you heard, for, for six years or so, uh, thinking about the same things at Channel 4 before that. We have, I think, been fascinatingly bad at predicting the future. The future, as they say in England, is not uh, uh, what it used to be. Um, uh, we've made many, many predictions which have turned out to be right. We've made, I think, even more which have turned out to be wrong. And in particular, uh, one essential prediction that we made, which is there was a model which you can call the substitution model, and we saw successive forms of conventional media, as it were, toppling over a precipice to be replaced by the internet. Uh, you might say certain forms of print media, uh, followed perhaps by music, uh, followed by radio, television, movies and so forth, has not really been the way the world's turned out. And so what I wanted to do is try and give you, uh, reasonably briefly, a kind of dispatch from, from the front lines of, of the way in which um, we, we think about these issues today. And from a broadcaster which, again, as I think Bill captured quite well, is uh, on the one hand an arch traditional broadcaster, uh, one of the first radio services in the world, the first continuous television service in the world in 1936, at well known for its radio and television around the world, but a broadcaster who's been thinking hard for 20 years about, about the future. This is a kind of dispatch on, on what we're thinking right now about this. Um, and I've got, I think, four themes for you. And the first theme is the strange persistence of traditional television. Um, here we are, it's 2011, uh, television viewing, in the United Kingdom and in many other countries of the world is going up. And this is conventional television viewing. It's not interactive television viewing. That's going up as well, by the way. Uh, the use of games consoles, the use of the internet, uh, the downloading and the uh, review of uh, TV and radio programs on the internet, that's growing as well. But essentially, traditional TV viewing is going up. The UK has around 25 million households. In 2010, 10 million television sets were sold in the United Kingdom. And behind that, there's been a lot of innovation in passive linear television. High definition, Dolby 5.1 surround sound, 3D arriving. So the passive experience has not been passive, lying back, waiting to be taken over by the, the hungry hordes of, of internet interactivity, it's actually been adapting and innovating and making its service richer, higher in quality, higher in choice. And within that, further, various forms of television which were reliably predicted to die out five or ten years ago have seen a remarkable renaissance. Um, we have a fantastic category of television, which at the BBC we call shiny floor entertainment. These are programmes, big entertainment programmes, where the floor is very shiny. Uh, uh, um, normally it begins with a drum roll, and there's a very big old style presenter, Bruce Forsyth, uh, for Brits in the room, would spring to mind. Bruce began his career when Ramesses II was on the throne in Egypt, um, and he's still there today. And they are big family moments to tune in. Well, these, these programs have died out in the 1990s in the United Kingdom, and they've now come back. They are bigger than ever. Uh, combined with a, a complete reinvention of family drama, 
Doctor Who and the BBC, in Britain and from the BBC would be an example of that. These programmes are bigger than ever. And the, the communal experience of linear, passive consumption is actually growing at the moment rather than diminishing. And that is essentially precisely the opposite of what was predicted by most of the experts. So does that mean that the internet is of no real relevance, that television is immune to, not touched by, doesn't have to worry about uh, everything that the internet brings? Well, obviously not. And having said that, that we begin with this rather curious phenomenon that, that, that um, something which was expected to be going the way of the dinosaurs is, is alive and kicking, doesn't begin to tell us everything that's going on. And I want to um, uh, use a rather simple model to try and illustrate, I think, some of the dynamics I see. And I want to use a division uh, of uh, mission for, for broadcasters, which was invented by the founder of the BBC, John Reith, who talked about the BBC's mission being to inform, educate, and entertain. It's a wonderful idea of the, the kind of universal mission of broadcasting. But let's just take information, education, and entertainment as three different kinds of media. And one of my propositions tonight would be that these different kinds of media are proceeding into the future at very different paces. And that information is far into the future already. That already we live in a world where you expect to get your information from multiple devices. Uh, and in fact, often it's quite hard to remember where you first heard about a news story. Was it on your Blackberry? Was it on a screen in an office? Was it on the radio in the morning? Was it using the web in the conventional way? Was it on the iPad? We live increasingly in a cloud of news information. It's very time critical. The kind of half-life value of in intellectual property in the space is very, very short. Uh, and the fact that people want it so quickly, they want it so conveniently, is partly why there's so much competition for devices and why the great grandees of global uh, news information, from Rupert Murdoch downwards, are obsessed with, is the iPad going to save us? Is this new device actually going to be the one that's going to work for us? This is because they, I think, correctly deduce that having it to hand, having it very conveniently, attractively available, could be mission critical in terms of getting their information, their branded information to the public. So that's hurtling into the future. And for the BBC, our strategies are absolutely based on the idea that BBC News is no longer really a television proposition or a radio proposition or even a conventional web proposition, but is a set of values and an approach to journalism and a deployed investment in journalism and above all in journalistic talent, outstanding professional journalistic talent, which we should try to get to the audiences in the UK and around the world in ways that make sense for them and as quickly as we reasonably can. But go to the other extreme and entertainment, and I think it's a very different picture with entertainment. I've talked about the way in which the passive television experience um, uh, has been getting, in various ways, higher quality um, uh, and, and richer um, uh, from a technological and a user experience point of view. But the other big story about passive entertainment is about choice. The arrival of multi-channel television, uh, and indeed you, you can take Wi-Fi radio and make the same point, has been a dramatic expansion in choice. And if I can use a, 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 a rather grand word, the other big development has been asynchronicity. In other words, a, a move from a world where essentially television was available to watch at a time of the schedulers choosing, to a time when it's available at your choosing, and people are increasingly expecting uh, asynchronicity to be available on all devices and immediately av available. Um, as Bill mentioned, we launched the iPlayer um, uh, uh, a few years ago, about three and a half years ago. Uh, the iPlayer uh, gives you uh, the ability to catch up on any of the television and radio programmes the BBC broadcast in the UK over the previous seven days. Uh, interestingly, uh, and like Netflix in the United States, but all, unlike almost everyone else, from day one, 
there were two things that we were clearly wanted to do. Mm. Firstly, was to make it instantly usable. No client download, no login, just instantly use it. So a flash player in the browser, picture of a television program, you touch the picture, the program is playing. And secondly, to define it as a service, which was not just a, 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 as it were a PC and, and Mac based web service, but as available on as many platforms as possible. And it's a wonderful arcane world of engineers writing code to deploy um, applications like iPlayer on different devices. And we were very proud one day we got a phone call from Netflix in the States to say, you've got some very cute code running on the Nintendo Wii. Could you tell us how you've done it? Because we'd like to do the same. Now, iPlayer um, uh, is an example of asynchronicity, which has really become very popular indeed. Um, I want to take December uh, 2010, so um, at the month before last. Um, this is the United Kingdom, 25 million households. Um, in December, we uh, 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 served live streaming 145 million television programs to 25 million households. This is uh, something like 16 petabytes uh, of data. Um, uh, I hadn't heard of the word petabyte until quite recently, but it's a big number. I think it's something like 1,000 million megabytes. Uh, I once read that the human, uh, the human written record from the first writings to, um, as it were, today's emails is probably in the 20 to 30 petabyte range. There's 16 million petabytes per month of data. So it is a colossal, and there are nights when we're more than 10% of the entire internet traffic in the UK. Now what's interesting is this is, on the one hand, a dramatic development, and it's using the internet as a rocket fuel form of distribution. But if you look really closely, it's actually finding new ways of distributing essentially a rather traditional experience, i.e. The, the linear viewing of television. And it's fair to say that although interactivity plays a significant part in the entertainment experience, it's nothing like as great as it is in the world of information, that amazing blogosphere of information, the debating, the arguing through the great issues of the day. Actually, quite traditional forms of interactivity, I think, are having a significant impact still. Phone voting. This is the age of the phone vote. Uh, using a relatively straightforward piece of technology, typically, I mean, texting, but principally the telephone to, to interact with entertainment programmes. And it's fair to say in entertainment, although we see interactivity growing, it's growing currently at a relatively modest rate. And although video games and the world of the video game, and in particular the multiplayer video game, is growing on the web, it's not yet clear to us. I think we can see what information looks like in the internet age. I'm not sure we yet know what entertainment looks like in the, in, in, in the internet age. And I've taken information, I've taken entertainment. It seems to me the world of education, of knowledge, of culture, sits somewhere between the two. We certainly know that using every platform we've got, every means of communicating we've got, is very powerful in this, in this area. But again, it feels like individual platforms are, are, as it were, they have their specialness. And depending on what you're trying to do, a particular platform, platform will be essential. We have a service called Bite Size, which is a straightforward educational resource available to uh, young people in the UK who are doing public exams at the age of 15 or 16. When Bite Size began, the most important way of getting to them was via the web and the PC, with some television programming to support it. By far the most important mechanism today is via mobile phones. Mobile phones are the, are the as well, weapon of choice of, of delivering um, um, advice on revision to 15-year-olds on their way into the exam room. And to take a completely different example, um, uh, in 2010 we ran a program uh, called uh, A History of the World in 100 Objects. This was a program by Neil McGregor uh, of the British Museum, really trying to, in a sense, do a rather fantastic uh, uh, panoptic uh, uh, insight into the world civilizations 
through the medium of just looking at a hundred artefacts from the from the collection of the British Museum. Now, it's you know the BBC is a modern broadcaster. We had a fantastic website. We had uh, any any number of ways of, of the public to interact. There was uh, a series of children's programmes on television. There was uh, a live uh, dimension of more than 300 museums up and down the country helping people have a physical experience of objects like the ones in the programme. But the heart of it, the very heart of this programme was uh, uh, done with the technology we could have deployed in 1927. It was essentially a handful of people doing short radio programmes on, on, on Radio 4, not even showing but describing the objects. So the strange way at the heart of what was a rather modern, multi-platform, multi-channel um, uh, experience uh, offered by the BBC was the place where the BBC began with a, a very, very traditional form of, of, of broadcasting. So I, I think it's a mistake to imagine that broadcasting is heading into this future at one speed. Uh, uh, I, I think what we're seeing is more diverse and in some ways more exciting.